Okay, okay. So that was a that you know that's a good list. That, that, that's a good list. I like that. So um, so uh, yeah, uh, I think another one that we need to um, also talk about is to be nimble. A lot of these things that we see, even though while in the big picture we might know they're going to come, that there's a wildfire is going to come or this or that, I think um, recognizing that we always have to have some flexibility. We always have to have some built-in ability to kind of scooch left, scooch right, scooch, scooch up, scooch down, um, because uh, there's always particular uh, nuances of how the disaster plays out with a particular community, with a particular setting that... Uh, you have to be able to adapt. Um, and so, uh, so for example, this morning when I pulled up my, my PowerPoint to show you guys that uh, none of the images were, are, are rendering for reasons I totally do not understand. I, I, do not, I do not understand. I've been giving talks for the last three weeks, never had a problem, but so, so uh, I have to be nimble myself when we talk about disasters. But, um, but uh, yeah, so one of the things I think we have these types of images when the, as we've talked about, when the disaster happens, a big crazy visual thing, right? Crazy flames, crazy um, scary destruction or something of that nature. But as I think we've all learned, th that's absolutely part of disasters, that that generates a, uh, an emotional response, a, a, a deep visceral response. But um, uh, much of the disaster story is, is not as dramatic as this, is not as sexy, is not as scary. It's, it's more of that day in, day out, how are we gonna plot along to make ourselves better to, to either recover or, or hopefully not get in a situation where we need to have that problem um, in the past. Uh, as a reminder, um, uh, as you guys were just saying, that we have on the order of 300 um, disasters a year, right? Um, and so we talked about this already, but the idea of if it's not going on here in Southern California, it's happening in Northern California. It's not going on in Northern California, it's happening in Idaho. It's not happening in Idaho, it's happening in Hawaii. It's not happening in Hawaii, it's happening in Korea. It's not happening in Korea, it's happening in Antarctica or wherever it is, right? Um, and so, uh, so these disasters are really common. Um, remember that the hazard is, is the possibility, the threat of something maybe going to occur. Um, and... Uh, uh, when it actually happens, that's when we officially use the term uh, disaster. Um, and, and obviously one of the overlays that we've, we've talked about is climate change, is, the, is, the, is the stuff like hotter temperatures, uh, uh, changing um, relative humidity in the atmosphere, different amounts of energy that these storms can possess, etc. Um, but another thing that I think hopefully has come across is, and as we've seen, disaster is more and more expensive, as Chris, Chris was referencing and stuff, that people are like, oh my God, it's so expensive. Partly, that's because of this, of our changing planet, right? Absolutely, that's part of the story. But that is but one part of the story. The actually more important, important part of the story is that there's just many, many, many more of us, of you and me. There's many more human beings here, A, and B, we're much more complicated in terms of the stuff that we do, right? So back in the day, the storm comes, whoop, uh, uh, kills my transportation, and then I have to have my two horses mate and have another baby horse so I can transport myself somewhere, right? Relatively simple. Now, when my transportation gets taken out, I have to spend, you know, who knows, tens and tens of thousands of dollars to get a car, and that car has computer chips in it, and gears from this country and, and, and servos from that country and all kinds of, so just the basic infrastructure of life has gotten more complicated. So if we had had this university building, uh, all right, I'll take that back. If we, had our, if we were in a different building for this class, right, one of our original structures, that's essentially, uh, say in Bell Tower West or something, let's say, that building was built uh, almost 100 years ago, right? And so, okay, that, that's cool, whatever. Th and, and, and if that got knocked down by, I don't know, a tidal wave, um, and we were to replace it, it's basically concrete. Concrete and some rebar. Maybe a little bit of terracotta tile. A, few, just a little bit of wood here and there. But that's basically it, right? Pretty simple. This building, oh my gosh, 
There's metal, there's drywall, there's electronic wiring, there's lighting, there's HVAC systems, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so just the very nature of us getting more sophisticated means that when a disaster strikes, even if the disasters aren't coming more frequently or more intensely, just that same, the same storm that would have hit, say, in 1950 that hits us now is going to be much more expensive, even if we you know, adjust the, you know, the dollars for, for the year. So, so more of us, more infrastructure uh, going on. Um, and then another key part is we've become, and so this also ties in with you guys were talking about like trends, uh, who's to blame, all that kind of stuff. Hey, don't people understand that this is a danger? So for example, in this case, we're looking at a levee up in the Sacramento Bay Delta that breached a couple years ago. And um, this is highly artificial, right? So, so this, this levee where these cars are driving on is, um, you know, was not historically there. Like we, we humans uh, either put it there or there, might, there was a sort of a natural levee there. We, we built it up. We made it, we made it the magnitude that it is now, right? And then we've just done our lives over here on the right-hand side, right? We've done our farming, we've put our houses in, we've put our businesses in, our airports, whatever it is, which is cool. And we've just come to assume, assume that that, 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 that engineered thing that we put in, in this case, uh, essentially a, a dirt wall between the river and us, is always gonna be there, right? It's always gonna be there. and so. So partly we are such good engineers, and, and especially in the earlier part of the you know, early 1900s to mid 1900s, we massively engineered so many of our landscapes here in California that we now move into houses, we move into parks, we move into uh, uh, you know, business establishments, and we assume that this is gonna be here, right? The classic example of this for us right now is, is the coastal zone, right? All those homes in Malibu, the sewage treatment plant in Oxnard, um, uh, the houses down in, in, in Ventura near the harbor, right? I mean, it's like, that, that just because we put the house there and it's been there for a few decades does not mean that that, that area is, is rocking and rolling, you know what I'm saying? So that's also part of this. Um, we've gotten used to, we've, we've assumed that stuff is always gonna work this way. Um, so, and, and we, we see pictures like this, we see pictures like this in the Delta or stuff in Louisiana or stuff in Bangladesh or whatever, and we're like, oh my God, those people are pretty silly. I can't believe it, right? They really are there, that's crazy, crazy. But these are our own levees here in um, Ventura County. And uh, this was from a couple years ago. This was a, a reassessment of, uh, of vulnerability. And essentially the red guys are ones that were like, yeah, hey, this ain't, mm, this not, it's not necessarily gonna stand up to a big flood event, right? The yellow is, yeah, it's not, yeah, I don't know, that, that's not so great. Only the green ones are sort of rocking and rolling according to, at the time, according to FEMA, right? So uh, while I think we, we sometimes, um, uh, less so now that we're having, we've had the Thomas fire and some of these big, large disasters here, but, but in general, um, I think we, we tend to, um, we're, we're fairly blessed here in that we're not in the middle of a big hurricane zone, we're not in the middle of a big tornado alley or something of that, that um, we kind of have historically, I'd say, looked at those other places and go, why do those people live there, right? People are now looking at us and saying, why do you live in Southern California with all those wildfires? Like, how can you possibly do that, right? So um, the point is, everybody is potentially vulnerable to something. The flip side of this is why you living in a danger zone. You shouldn't be there. And obviously in an extreme danger zone, an extreme hazard, yes, we should not be living, working there, correct. But the notion that I'll just go to the safe place, as, as I think we've also taken, I, I hope you've also taken away from this semester, that there really is no quote unquote safe place. There are places that are safer, but everywhere in some way, shape or form, either an atmospheric disturbance, a geological hazard, pandemic, we're all potentially um, exposed to, to these, these risks, right? And that's not to give everybody a pass, but that's to say that, um, that we all can do, we all can get better. We all can be more, more resilient and stuff when, when we talk about uh, these disaster things. Um, a couple folks talked about uh, this, I think in one of our posters, but Oroville Dam, who did, who did Oroville Dam? Didn't somebody do Oroville? Yeah, you guys did Oroville Dam. So you guys tell us 
Uh, I think we talked a little bit about it, but, but give us a quick overview of Oroville, what happened with this. Cool. Um, and that pretty much like the the dam flooded and it like it luckily didn't flood the whole town, but the, the it affected the river and stuff like that. So the spillway got destroyed basically. Yeah, excellent, good. So I would say um, I tend to I'll say climate change when I'm talking like introduction to the topic or whatever, so people understand what I'm talking about. But usually when we really get into it, I prefer the term global weirding because I think that's a more accurate description. Yes, things are gonna get warmer. Yes, the climate's gonna change, but really what's happening is um, what we've come to expect is changing. We've come to expect it'll be warm in this time of the spring. We've come to expect it'll be like this much rain in the winter time. And sometimes it's going crazy up, sometimes it's going crazy down. So it's, it's um, I mean, the, 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 the big long-term trends are in one direction, but, but but how it actually manifests is really crazy. And that's what was happening here with, with like Oroville's we just heard, which was huge amount of rain, more rain than we were expecting or used to. And again, you know, as we've talked about, our whole water system is a highly engineered thing. If you recall, we get about two, th the, the state of California gets about two thirds of its water from the northern part of the state, but two thirds of our population roughly lives in the southern part of our state. So essentially a lot of our state water project is designed to plumb, re-plumb nature, suck that water from up north, bring it uh, south to us, Kazuntai, Kazuntai. And so Lake Oroville is one of the many uh, components of this. And so it was designed for the typical rain event, the typical water level, and then there's some extra excess capacity as engineers design it, so in case we get a lot of rain. But, but what is a lot has been changing, right? What is not a lot has been changing. What is too much has been changing. And so that's essentially what happened here. Essentially, the engineered structures got overwhelmed. And the thing on the light blue over here, the emergency spillway, which was not designed to be used only if like something goes awry, um, essentially, uh, uh, we had to use it. The main spillway, which is this dark blue, uh, uh, like slide, like concrete slide, essentially um, was capturing water for a while and then started to have a problem and then started to erode. And this is essentially an earthen dam. So even though it's a big, huge, you know, Hagante thing and it's massive, ultimately it's, it's just packed earth. And so as this, as this erosion was starting, they're like, oh my gosh, if this starts to eat away and eat away and eat away and eat away, eventually it can cut out the face of this thing. We could have a you know, you know, flood of water, a biblical wall of water, you know, rushing down to the people down below. Um, and that's what it looked like as it was starting to erode, right? So you have this water coming and undercutting. You can see how quickly it was starting to take out that dirt. Dirt was fine when you have a little bit of rain and you have vegetate, you have, you know, grasses and shrubs and trees on it. But when you have this essentially a, a, a high powered hose just shooting at the dirt, it doesn't it doesn't stick up too well to that, right? Um, and so uh, this is an example of, of how cut away it was. Um, and there's some stuff and, and, and there was worry. So we're like, oh, okay, we'll just have it go. We'll just have it go in this emergency spillway, this other way off the top, which had never been used ever. Um, and so theoretically it could work, but then the worry was like, oh my gosh, that could also uh, be a problem. Um, and so, yeah. So basically, then uh, a key part of this, as you guys have all learned, is it's not just that part. It's not just the, the molecules of water moving over the surface, but as we've talked about in our class, it's also the human systems. It's, it's the preparation we've done, um, marginalized groups not having access to information or ability to transport themselves away in a, in a safe, effective manner, um, all that kind of stuff. And so, so uh, another example in this case was, you know, no warnings, no warnings, and all of a sudden, oh my God, get out right now, right? 
a huge thing that we've touched on at various times in this class is how do you get people to, to jump when we say, you guys got to jump, go now, but not do it so often that we get accused of crying wolf, right? And so usually the first time or two, you're like, you guys, get the hell out of here. You're like, what? Okay, Dr. Aver, come here, and we go, right? But the fifth time when I said, get the hell out of here, you'd be like, uh, yeah, hold on, let me get my bags first, and let me do it, right? Because you're like, I've done this four times, and he said get the hell out of here right now, and nothing happened the last four times, so do I really need to get out, right? And that's just a natural human thing. And so that, that, that's never, as with many of our issues, that's never a solved thing. That's always uh, in the process of being solved and, and always negotiating that how do we, how do we not, not pull the trigger too early, right? And do a false warning, but how do we, but we wanna make sure, we wanna err on the side of making sure nobody dies, but if we do that too often, people will become anesthetized to that warning and not, not jump when we tell them it's time to jump kind of thing. And so there was some of that going on here um, with these guys. Um, eventually the, the town below the dam, uh, Oroville uh, does, uh, get flooded, so it, it doesn't flood as bad as the fear was of this big giant wall of water, but nevertheless, we do see flooding. Um, and this is a good example of, at least part of this is a good example of some of the, I mean, some people had their homes flooded and stuff, I'm not trying to say that everybody escaped fine, but one of the things we've learned is to adapt to flooding. And so one of the, the key things we, we've been talking about in the wake of particularly flood hazards is the idea of pulling back from the immediate floodplain, right? So maybe it's like taking those houses out, not having those houses be there, have it be a park, right? So we can still use it, it's still a green space, still can have bird's nests and all that kind of good stuff. But, um, but were the river to jump the banks or, or to get to flood stage level, um, uh, that's gonna you know, be bad for the picnic benches for a little bit, but it's not gonna destroy businesses, it's not gonna destroy transportation networks, it's not gonna destroy people's lives per se. Um, we might have to hose out the bathroom, maybe, you know, it has mud in it after, but that's way better than having, you know, a bunch of houses needing to be rebuilt kind of thing. Um, and so I'd say this is, while this looks horrible, and this is not an ideal situation, this is an example of, um, of us understanding that there's a, there's a very strong hazard right next to the water. Um, let's see if we can play this. Still see this as a dangerous situation, though they do say there are reasons for hope. However, they are keeping the evacuations in place for right now. Let's show you some video of the problem. As you mentioned, the Oroville Dam is the tallest dam in America. Several days ago, they started noticing problems on what's called a spillway. Basically, a spillway is a way for the dam to release water so it doesn't overflow. They have a main spillway, kind of looks like a slide, if you will. I've seen that slide. There was some erosion going on underneath of that cement spillway. It eventually caused a hole in the spillway, so they started using a secondary spillway, more of a natural spillway, where they also can release water. Well, that one started eroding, and they started seeing more problems. Well, yesterday, things got very urgent. Officials got some news, got some information that made them think that this spillway could be compromised. If that happened, they, that could send 30 feet high flood of water into the neighboring areas. So they ordered the evacuations of more than 100,000 people. Among those evacuated were more than 500 inmates of the Butte County Jail. They were taken to Alameda County. That's something that just came out in this news conference. They said they didn't release where they were taking those inmates to yesterday for safety concerns. However, they say they are making some progress. They were releasing a lot of water through the spillway, one of the compromised spillways, and they say that has reduced some of the water in the reservoir there, so they think things are looking better. However, they are still not ready to let people back in. Here's more from some local officials. Uh, this is still a dynamic situation. It's still a situation we're trying to assess the damage, and we need to make, we need to have time to uh, make sure that before we allow people back into those uh, areas, it is safe to do so. So, I want to make it clear, the evacuation is still in effect. We're working um, to really you know, uh, dig down into the reservoir and remove as much water out of that reservoir, and so we have space for the storms that we expect to um, come in, as well as the snow runoff later this spring. You know, 
know, one of the reasons the sheriff is being adamant that the evacuations are still in effect, he said at the beginning of that news conference that there were rumors floating around that the evacuations are going to be lifted at 4.15 this afternoon. He said those rumors are absolutely false. They do not know when they're going to lift the evacuations at this point. As you heard him say, it is still a situation they're monitoring by the minute to see when they might be able to let people back in here. Okay. So another one uh, that, so, so I think that that illustrate a lot of things we're talking about, right? So, so numbers are really important, right? They, they get the attention, 100,000 people, and then, and then oftentimes um, maybe things that sound scary. Oh, and prisoners, what? We have moving all the prisoners. Oh my God, that sounds sketch. That sounds dangerous, right? Um, the folks in charge, uh, uh, there's a degree of uncertainty that they're communicating, right? We don't know what's going on, right? We want you guys to do this because we're not sure what's happening and you're kind of like, wait, you guys don't know what's going on? How am I, rando, rando citizen, supposed to know what to do, right? And then another key thing here is that, uh, you know, I required everybody to have at least a, a short-term subscription. I really, 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 really hope you all keep, I want to encourage you all to keep your subscriptions to, to major news, uh, especially news, organizations that do investigative journalism, fund those things, right? That's how we have authoritative info. Um, TikTok, Instagram, all that kind of stuff, that's great for what, what top you should be wearing and, and all that kind of stuff. A really crappy place for this information. Almost all of these things, New Orleans, Thomas Fire, whatever, as we heard right here, these rumors burn like wildfire through these places. Oh, they're gonna, they're gonna, you can go back to your home after four. Oh, they're going to stop doing this. Oh, hey, there's a water pickup place over there. It's not that, it's not that every 100% of that information is wrong, but you don't know, especially in a rapidly unfolding disaster context, you don't know. So you need to go to those authoritative sources, those, those solid journalistic outfits that um, will tell you. I mean, they're not perfect. People make mistakes, but, but more often than not, you're, you're not going to get the craziness there that you will on um, some of these alternative sources of information. So one of the reasons I wanted you guys to, to do that subscription is one, so that you could do your scuba post, but two, that's a great, that's another great disaster preparation tool. Pay attention, Re, you know, subscribe to newspapers, subscribe to this information source, support this information source. When we need them, they're there, and they're objective, and they're helping us understand these situations. And when you're wondering, is the disaster, is the uh, warning really going to be lifted at four? You can you can go over to your to your website and and, and see if that's really valid or not, right? So um, so cool. Um, uh, again, uh, when we talk about the human dimension, really really important. In this case, all of a sudden they're like, hey, you hundred thousand people, get out of town, right? And and there aren't you know a hundred thousand roads out of town, right? So so almost invariably this is going to lead to this kind of stuff. To, to brake lights and slow stuff, and then somebody's gonna get a flat tire, and I don't know, and, and what are we gonna do? And, and, and one of our colleagues, um, I don't know if I shared the story, but in the um, Woolsey fire, one of our colleagues knew someone that lived in Malibu where the fire was happening. Um, I'll just say, maybe not the most um, aware person living in Malibu. Um, and was like, all of a sudden, turn on the tube and, oh, fire, ha! Huh. Grabbed a painting, grabbed her dog, I think grabbed a toothbrush, I think, and that was literally about it. Jumped in the car, started driving, and hit this stuff, and which was not, that, that's not the norm on PCH. I mean, in the middle of summer, you know, noon, 4th of July, sure, but not, not at, you know, December uh, evening time. Uh, uh, found this, ran out of gas. Because once she was in the car, noticed that, oh my gosh, I, I don't have, I have almost no gas in my tank. And it was, it was like, you know, an hour or two or something like this, sitting like this. So eventually her car just died. Or, the, or, the, or the, the, the car, you know, petered out. And she had to pull off the side of the road. And so thankfully somebody gave her a ride. But, but you know, that dimension, that human dimension of stuff is, is so important. Um, and uh, we can always say we want to be prepared but these things always seem to care come when we're like, like the one weekend that we're going to our sister's wedding that we don't have the thing and we didn't pack the thing or whatever. So, so um, another great one, again, we've not talked about in our class, but a great idea to have um, 
a little go kit in your car, as well as you know, a little earthquake kit at home. Um, but, but something in your car, since so many of us spend so much of our time away from home, um, having that in the car, which is maybe some extra batteries, an extra little solar blanket, something of that nature, some extra water bottles, um, really, really helpful. Um, and then this was, this was another example of how long it was taking for some of our agencies that historically responded very quickly um, because of the politicization and the, and the polarizations that we've mentioned. Um, that is creeping into, uh, unfortunately, some of our some of our responses to these to these events. Um, and then I just want to finish up saying that uh, you know our our campus also has been on fire quite literally, right? So the last time we burned was 2013 in the Camarillo Springs fire, and um, and that was incredibly fast. So I, I we talked about this in the lectures on uh, wildfires, but. But just as a reminder, right, so this started on the grade, on, on the Conejo grade, uh, on the 101, um, about, mm, about, I forget, like 6.30 in the morning, right? And uh, it just so happened my son's uh, class was going on a field trip to Olivas Adobe that day, and they were going to be driving across the grade in the school bus, and uh, I asked, and so I went to, I was a, one of the, chaperones and I went there and I remember talking to the school bus driver I'm like hey you know there's a fire like, I'm on fire we're fine I'm like yeah but there's a fire like right next to the road where we're driving that's yeah, fine and then he pulled out his phone and he calls his, disp his uh, school bus dispatch person um, and they're like yeah you're fine and he's like yes yeah, so we're just gonna go. I'm like well you know maybe we should take an alternative route and he's like nope nope we're, we're good you know bah, 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 bah. So like, okay, so we got on the bus, and, and as we're going down at first, you know, at this point, I don't remember what time it was that point, like, that was like 7.30 or 8 or whatever, right? And, and so we start going, and it's, and it's obviously, there's a huge amount of smoke, and it's like, you know, uh, not a normal roadway, right? And our lanes were kind of going okay. The lanes going towards LA, which, which was, right next to where the fire was, they were all stopped. And there was, there, as we were going, there was no traffic coming the other way because the fire folks had, had shut down those, that direction of traffic flow. And we got out there, this is an old school bus, right? O old school school bus with like the, the, the skanky windows and like the no seat belts and all that kind of stuff. Or I guess we have seat belts, but nobody uses them. Um, and, uh, and so the kids all had little uh, cam they all had cameras, right? Like, like point and shoot cameras. Um, not, this was, this was uh, a little bit ago, so not everybody had a cell phone, right? And so they held, had these ins instamatic cameras and stuff. And at first, we saw all these flames, and the kids were like, "What? This is so cool, Mr. Anderson! The wheels like what?" And I'm like, "Oh, maybe we shouldn't." Ah, this is great! And they all like open up their windows, mm -hmm. and they're taking photos, like, "Oh, oh, oh. And we're like, sit down, sit down." And you like, "Oh my God, this is crazy!" And then the smoke started coming into the bus, and they're like, "Uh." This sucks. Uh, we can't get, Mr. Anderson, I can't raise the window. And then it became like, oh my God. Uh, and so um, to me, that always sticks in my head as one of the examples of, you know, at first it, it fun, well, I mean, the kids thought it was fun, but you know, at first it looks like, oh, this is kind of crazy, or I'll be able to navigate this experience. I'll be able to, to, to get through this or whatever, right? Or we'll just push through. And then these things can turn amazingly fast and become very scary and become very um, uh, you know, stressful. And that's what happened you know, to us. But obviously, it was just the fire starting, so the bus goes through the smoke pretty fast, and we were fine after you know, a minute or two. But, um, but I always think of these people going like, this is awesome, to oh my god, we can't get the windows up. And that, that just seems to be a metaphor for a lot of our, um, a lot of our dealing with these things. Um, so. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think I mentioned this in the lecture, but just to finish up, so we go to Levis Adobe, and the whole time I'm looking back, and the smoke is just growing and growing and growing and growing, and then um, and then basically uh, I'm like, ah, it looks like it's kind of, and then we're getting winds, right, Santa Ana winds. I was like, ah, it's kind of. Uh, it happened. Uh, it, it happened um, almost exactly uh, this time of year. It happened, I think, on May second. It started, um, and uh, and then. I start getting, my phone starts blowing up. And has anybody been to Olivas Adobe? I guess it's a school group. So it's one of those historic reenactment things, right? So they're all in their, 
like 1770s gear and they're making tallow and, and hand, hand, you know, uh, squeezed tortillas and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and so they're talking to the kids about, about like what it was like to be in the Adobe back in the day. And my phone's like, and all these people are like from far away and local like, oh my God, are you okay? Oh my God. And I'm like, uh, and the dude who was the historic reenactor was like, uh, Sumi Sir, there's no cell phones in 1776 or whatever. And I'm like, oh yeah, I know. It's like, Sumi Sir, there's no cell phones in 1776. I'm like, oh, I know. Like, Sir, there's no, and the kids thought it was very funny that I was getting in trouble. Um, and so I kind of had to put my phone away and was waiting for a minute or two. And then when I pulled it out, there was a, so at the time our, la our ESRM lab was behind Malibu or was in Malibu Hall. And so somebody texted me a picture from the Ventura County Star where there was a firefighter on the outside of our building with like leaning back, so like feet, you know, two feet away from the building and he's like full on leaning back with a hose just blasting and the flames were about a meter or two from his face. And I was like, oh, I guess the lab's gone, right? And, uh, and that, that had gone from there to campus in about two hours. And all campus was evacuated, obviously. Um, the only reason campus exists now is for just the grace of God, um, uh, there were no other wildfires in the state in, at that, that particular May, right? So we didn't have like, 17 crews over there and 14 crews deployed there. So, so when this started to happen, all these calls went out and all, we had full staffing in our regional fire departments and they all flooded the area. So there was something on the order of 400, 500 firefighters came just to campus, just on campus. Um, and then another big thing they defended was the radar facility uh, installation just at the top of Magoo Peak. That's also a really important thing. Um, and, and so, Saved it. We lost a couple buildings out at Camp Park, a couple little like you know, irrigation things. We lost our new entrance road, all the citrus we planted, and some, some irrigation. But, and we had like a, a, a part of a roof too here got a little bit of a spark and a little bit of a small, small ember burning. But amazing that this campus survived. That was because we were prepared. That's because we had adequate resources. That's because we got lucky. That's because everybody paid attention when campus said, hey, evacuate. Um, and so no one died. We had no, it was very costly in terms of like redoing landscaping, but, but no, no major structures lost through an insane conflagration that looked like this. I mean, it was really pretty uh, uh, amazing that we got through as, as unscathed as we did. So the fact that we have our campus here is a testament to effective, responsible disaster planning. And so we've talked about a lot of scary things this semester, but know that with planning, and, and, and open the eyes and, and being you know, open to hearing ideas and new ideas, we can definitely navigate these disasters, right? This isn't the end of the world kind of thing. We're, we've talked about all this stuff this semester to arm you with information so that we can avoid these bad, scary, horrible outcomes that we sometimes see. Um, and with that, that's all, the, that's all the fancy things I wanted to say. Thanks, you guys, for, for engaging this semester. Thanks for all your work. I know we're not quite done yet. But, um, but give yourselves a hand. That was, that was a, I hope you guys enjoyed this class. And I hope you guys learned some stuff. And I hope this is definitely one of those classes you can draw upon after you guys graduate and, uh, and, and remember back when we talked about